My name is Nick Christellis, and this lecture is uh, giving you an overview on the history and examination of a pain patient. There will be subsequent lectures and topics on the history in an expanded format, as well as the examination in an expanded format. But here we'll give you an overview on how to approach these patients. So the aims when approaching a pain patient uh, are threefold, and you would consider them over in your mind as you're doing your history, as you're doing your examination. So that can give you an idea of where to put your resources. So ask yourself over and again, what are the risk factors for this patient? In other words, what are the things that I can treat? What are the things that I can refer on? What are the things that I can modify in order to reduce the chronicity of this problem and to actually facilitate just better pain management? It's also to be aware of the things that you can't change um, because uh, this may or may not be of relevance for your patient. So the risk factors uh, are five-fold, and you could consider them in five categories, which I'll elaborate on in a second. In fact, let's do that right now. This comes from uh, an article from the British Medical Journal in 2002, uh, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, you've got the reference to it by Maine and... Uh, Williams, looking at risk factors for those patients with pain. So you would consider them under various flag systems. So the red flags, the orange flags, the yellow, blue and black flags. Now I'm not saying you need to do this, but it's a nice way of approaching your patients. Um, so the red flags, you're asking yourself when you're seeing these patients, what are the flags, what are the medical issues that I need to diagnose or that I, I should not be missing? Um, and if I pick up any of these medical issues that are red flags, that are dangerous, I need to refer them on to colleagues, specialists, immediately. So these, risk, these, these red flags include infection and cancer. And this is important in, in those with, say, chronic post-surgical pain. Patients have um, a, a persistent pain post-operation. You need to consider two main red flags. Is there post-operative infection that I can't see that's brewing? Or is there recurrence of the cancer? So, for example, those that have had thoracotomy now present with post-surgical thoracotomy pain. Make sure uh, you've got yourself or your colleagues that have excluded recurrence of the cancer. Other red flags when you examine your patients in the clinical setting, bear in mind, do they have any neurology? Is there any Are there any features of cord equinus syndrome? Is there any structural deformity? Are there any steps in the spine? Do they have HIV? Are they intravenous drug users? That will put your hairs up and that would make you consider red flags. And of course, are they especially particularly unwell? Are there any significant concurrent medical problems? So what are the red flags? Don't forget this. This is important. Then you move on to the orange flags. Now these you would consider as serious psychiatric illnesses. These will prevent, or these are barriers to effective pain management. If you diagnose any orange flags or serious psychological issues, or psychiatric, should I say, issues, you need to refer on immediately or talk to your psych psychiatrist colleagues immediately. Orange flags include major personality disorders, substance abuse disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, high levels of distress and, and psychosis. These are generally easy to diagnose, but you need to bear them in mind when you're assessing a patient so you don't miss them. If, they, if patients have these problems, it would be difficult to effectively manage their pain. Now, the yellow flags, this is the, these are the issues that can generally be addressed with a pain management program. These are psychobehavioral issues. These are things we need not to miss when we make our assessment. And we generally draw in on our allied health colleagues, our physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and psychologists to aid our assessment and aid our management. Um, yellow flags include the big two, which are maladaptive behaviors. So how is this patient behaving? Is it is an appropriate behavior? Are there a number of pain behaviors? And what are their thoughts and cognitions around their disease process or Ill, pro, uh, illness process? Other yellow flags include poor coping strategies, and a number of these things we'll get to at uh, the lecture on the history. But essentially, how are these people coping? Are they passive in their approach to the pain and, and management of pain? Are they active? Are they proactive and motivated to get better? What are their coping strategies? 
Is there an element of pain catastrophizing? Now, catastrophizing, you'll also get a, le also get a lecture on. This is important. There is a growing cohort of evidence on uh, catastrophizing. Um, it is an important uh, feature not to miss. And what it means is that the patient displays three aspects, and that is they, they ruminate over their problems, they have high levels of anxiety, they magnify the problem uh, and issues, and they have a sense of hopelessness as well. Do the patients have an eye external locus of control? Um, do they feel like uh, that uh, the situation that they're in is beyond their control? Um, in other words, it's all down to fate and bad luck. Or do they have a high internal locus of control, meaning that they feel they can, they can uh, deal with things and have control over the situation? Do they display fear and avoidance? And this goes hand in hand with catastrophizing. Are they fearful of doing particular uh, activities or, or movements? And do they avoid these? And does this lead to avoidance of particular things? Is there anxiety and depression? Providing it's not significantly high levels of anxiety, depression, so post-traumatic stress disorder or severe depression, you can generally get to these patients with pain management programs. Is there secondary gain? Is there a reason for them to fit into this illness behavior? Are they gaining something from this? Do they have an over-solicitous spouse? Um, is that feeding into the problem? So that's something you need to consider as well. And, of course, is there any litigation or compensation thrown into the mix? And certainly we see a lot of that here, and that can um, put a spanner in the works and, and be a confounding factor when assessing and managing these patients. Looking at the blue and black flags, you may or may not choose to um, uh, consider these, but it's probably worthwhile doing that even at the very uh, slightest so what are the what are the uh, what is the patient's effects or perception of the occupation that they're working in? Do they are they working? Are they not working? Are they afraid of working? What do they enjoy their work? Is it a highly stressful job that they're doing? Those are the blue flags, and the black flags are the actual work conditions. Now those associated with poor working conditions, uh, manual labour, unsociable hours tend to reoccur in pain patients. So considering the risk factors, what are them are modifiable, those that I've just spoken about, and how can I treat them? Now, that when you see pain patients, there are a number of things that we shouldn't be doing, and we shouldn't be missing out on the psychology of pain. So always consider the psychology of your patients. Don't over-investigate your patients. So this is already normally done when by the time they see pain consultants or pain clinics. They've had that cohort of investigations. Don't over-treat your patients. Don't subsequently um, put them through process after process, um, in intervention after intervention, without having some definite endpoint, without the patient understanding the endpoint. Don't be inconsistent in your care as well. Patients want consistency. They want the same level of um, um, care when they see you. And importantly, educate your patients. Your patients have come to you for support. Your patients have come to you for guidance as well. Don't forget to guide them. Don't forget to educate them on their situation. Sometimes that, that's all it takes to get patients over the next hurdle. And you might ask yourself, what are the things that I can't modify? Well, things include age. Young patients, old patients feel and respond to pain differently, and you'll get lectures on pain in the elderly and pain in the young. Gender is important as well, and that's huge, hugely topical at the moment. So uh, females feel pain differently to males. And histories of abuse and neglect, which feature significantly in pain patients, generally is something you cannot change, but it's something that you might address with a pain management program or subsequent um, resources. So again, if you don't ask or if you don't consider, you'll miss these things. Now, let's talk about presenting your case. And this is the way you could consider, and I'm going to give you an uh, uh, quite a quite a large uh, number of things to consider in your presentation and what I want you to do is I want you not to do everything but I want you to consider all these things and you may or may not choose to take a number of these headings depending on you your needs and your patients needs so you want to start off with when you're presenting a case you want to start off with your opening statement you want it to be short you want it to be succinct you want it to be punchy
um, and you want it to uh, convey to whoever you're talking to that you understand the case. Now, we're not registrars and um, junior doctors anymore. We're now specialists, so we need to convey that. And what your colleagues don't want to hear is that you've seen Mrs. XY. She's had an appendicectomy, um, and uh, she's got such and such and such a problems, and she's got a background of X, Y, and Z. You want to give this uh, message across in a short and succinct way. So, for example, your opening statement might read something like this. This is quite a long statement, but I want you to get the I want you to get the message. Mrs. A and B, she's 32 years old. She presented with back pain and had a spinal fusion 15 years ago. The GP managed the pain inappropriately with escalating and now huge doses of opioids that failed to reduce her pain or improve function. There are a number of physical, functional, and psychological barriers that were present. These included deconditioning, anxiety depression, and a past physical abuse by her first husband. Although I noticed a number of facilitators of recovery that were also present, these included a high internal locus of control, motivation to reduce opiate therapy, and a caring second husband and family. So that's the opening statement. Hopefully I've gotten all the necessary information across to my colleague. Then, B, you may or may not choose to present your pain orientated problem list. Now some you may you may choose to do this if there's a whole list of problems that you want to get through. And remember of relevance to the pain. Um, and the other thing to do is um, to consider each one in turn. Now this you could consider as part of your flag system. So your biological issues, your functional issues, psychological issues, and your social and vocational issues. So for example the pain not pain oriented problem list might go something like this. There are, there are medical, functional and psychosocial issues that I'd like to mention. The medical issues are there is ongoing moderate to severe lower back pain of failed back surgery syndrome. Um, there is grade 1 spondylolisthesis with, with degenerative disc disease with the possibility of ongoing discogenic pain. Secondly, there's sacroiliac joint as a pain generator. Thirdly, there was some central sensitization with allodynia and hyperalgesia. Fourth, there was an element of opioid-induced hyperalgesia. And this is because of her diffuse pain, high doses of opioids given and um, for a long period of time. Then the functional issues, which would include deconditioning with a globally reduced movement of the lower limbs, limited tolerances and restrictions in activities of daily living, which will include her ability to self-care, do domestic chores, enjoy herself. She was also unable to look after her children. And then the psychosocial issues included mild depression, suicidal ideation, but no intent. There was anxiety. There was physical dependence on opioids. Uh, she was dependent on other medications, such as benzodiazepines and tobacco. There was also a past history of physical verbal abuse, and she was unable to afford pregabalin. So that's the pain oriented problem list. You might want to do it just in a bang-bang bullet point, or you might want to do one point and slightly elaborate. So you might say sacroiliac joint is a pain generator, or just elaborate that a little bit by saying there was exquisite left sacroiliac tenderness with local radiation and a positive Faber test. So that's the problem oriented list, and it must be relevant to your patient. I may not want to know that there has been an appendicectomy in the past if it's not relevant. Of course, it might be relevant in that they've had previous surgical, post-surgical pain, but again, so it's pain orientated. Now, the pain history is going to be um, just that, the history of the pain, and that's important to get across. So the pain history might go something like this. Her pain started when she was 18 years old, had a minor fall. She was diagnosed with a grade 1 anterior spondylolisthesis. She had an L5-S1 decompression with a bony spinal lumbar fusion. She couldn't remember if she was diagnosed with spinal stenosis per se, but she said she recovered well from the surgery and she had no subsequent back pain. She then developed some minor non-specific back pain during her pregnancies, but se developed severe pain following her last pregnancy, and this has gotten progressively worse over the last five years. She describes her pain as stabbing and prodding in the center of her lower back, radiating down to both hips. There's a shooting component radiating to, from the center of her back 
down to the lateral aspects of both buttocks, upper thighs anteriorly, and to the knees, but never down to the feet. She didn't describe the classic uh, band-like pain characteristic of radicular pain. Her pain was constant, but also fluctuated. Pain was worsened with walking, as well as sitting. Her pain was movement-related, uh, but also worsening uh, when static. Worst pain scores in the last 24 hours were 10 out of 10, and the lowest pain scores were 7 out of 10. The pain improved only mildly with medication, and this is important. What happened to the pain with medication? You might want to mention in your pain history functional limitations, and this is very important. The patient might be completely functional, um, or might be completely, uh, um, be completely unable to do anything. So the functional limitations, she could only walk a short distance, could sit for 10 minutes at a time only. She was able to do personal aspects of self-care, but was unable to do any housework, because her husband did it, and her husband needed to do this. She did some shopping, but didn't cook. She stopped driving one and a half years ago because she didn't feel safe on the roads. And this might be a cognitive issue, particularly with high doses of opioids. She was unable to play with her kids and did not socialize because of the pain. She only slept four hours a night, and this was broken by stress, pain, and worry. With the pain history, you can want to give a medication history, and don't forget to include the medications that didn't work, or the trials or therapies that didn't work. So in this case, it might read something like, she trialed pregabalin, 300 milligrams BD, which helped the pain, but she found it too expensive. She's now been on fentanyl, 100 microgram patches for three years now. She'd previously tried to reduce the dose to 75 microgram patches, but experienced withdrawal effects. She also took endone, 25 milligrams, four times a day. She also took paracetamol, diazepam 5, QID, and temazepam at night. So that's the pain history. Now moving on to the pain-orientated physical examination, and this will get better with time and practice. Um, going on to the faculty of uh, pain medicine website of Australia, there is um, a number of uh, examinations given by Professor Milton Cohen, which is excellent and recommended by the faculty. And so I recommend you to go and have a look at that. Now when we deal with our examination, we will focus more on examination when you get a patient, uh, say with back pain or, or headaches or arm pain. So more tailored to the clinical situation and allowing you to approach a particular patient with a particular problem. Nevertheless, the pain-orientated physical exam is something, as I said, that's going to take practice. So it might go something like this. XY or Mrs. XY displayed pain behaviors such as groaning, moving slowly with guarding and needing her husband to undress her. Gait was normal. She had globally reduced range of movement of the lumbar spine. She had 10 to 15 centimeter non-tender midline scar in her lower back. There was no facet joint tenderness, but there was a widespread area of local back tenderness that extended well laterally beyond the axial spine. I was able to demonstrate static mechanical allodynia and pinprick hyperalgesia in this area, and this didn't display a dermatoma or anatomical distribution. She had some weakness in her legs with power of 4 out of 5, which I assessed as secondary to pain, and not due to actual weakness, because she had good muscle bulk bilaterally with normal tone and reflexes. Sensation of the legs was normal. There was no hip stiffness or tenderness. She had a negative straight leg raise test, a negative femoral stretch test. Although when assessing the sacroiliac joint, a left-sided Faber test, uh, that's forced abduction and external rotation, reproduced her pain in her left buttock. She also had a tender left SI joint with local radiation of pain on direct palpation. So that's how your um, 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 POPE exam or may, may go. Now moving on to the formulation. This is where I hope you can shine and this is where you need to show that you understand the patient and what's going on. And the way you can approach your formulation is under a number of headings. You might describe the sources of pain and the mechanisms of pain. So for example, you might say something like, this patient had failed back surgery syndrome, discogenic jo uh, joint uh, disc disease, and a tender left sacroiliac joint. So there may have been a mixed uh, nociceptive and neuropathic component to pain. There were clinical features of sensitization, and this might be due to an opioid-induced hyperalgesia. 
And there were psychological features of depression and anxiety which may be associated or may be a source of pain or way that she's communicating her pain with me. So mentioning these sources of pain may open up the topic, these points as topics for further discussion. What are the predisposing factors you might want to consider and talk out loud? So she was a female, and this may be of importance with gender differences in pain. She's had failed back surgery, or she's had back surgery in the past. This may be important in predisposing factors. There may be, any, well, there was a history of abuse and neglect, and this, again, might be important. What are precipitating factors? There may or may not have been trauma or infection, something to get things going. What are the aggravating factors? What are the relieving factors? This might be something that you wish to choose to, um, to elaborate on. So aggravated by lack of sleep, um, aggravated by various levels of anxiety or social or family pressures. Um, this shows that you understand the, psych the psychology and social aspects of her pain. Um, you might want to mention the modifiable obstacles and barriers, those flags that we've mentioned. You might want to mention one or two of those catastrophizing self-efficacy and elaborate on that. Um, and then what are the things you can't modify, as we've mentioned? And then are there any facilitators, anything that we can work with to, to, um, to reduce the pain? So an example would be something like um, she had a caring husband, she had a high internal locus of control uh, by attempting dose reductions with her GP in the past. So again, the formulation is you're thinking out aloud and you're showing, you're showing your colleague that you've picked up the important aspects. So the modifiable barriers would be um, um, displaying anxiety, mild depression in this case, and you can talk about these in turn. There was physical dependence. She was taking a number of drugs of dependence and which, you could, which could open up topics to talk about. Okay, so let's move on to the plan and goals. And this is how you're going to approach your patient. Now, I've done this quite extensively um, to allow you or to give you a list of things to consider for each and every patient if you so choose. You may not choose to do everything, but it might be that this is a way of giving you a background, a structure to approach your patient. So every patient I see, I consider treatment according to um, these five areas. So medication. What medication or what medical things can I do for the patient? Can I reduce the pain? Can I modulate the pain with medication? Can I change, add, subtract medication? Can I stop medication that's causing problems or side effects? Can I ultimately reduce the patient's need for treatment? Can I reduce her coming back to the healthcare service over and over? And of course, because we're, um, uh, some of us are interventionalists, some of us are um, may choose to do interventions or blocks, and you might do them yourself or you might refer your patient on. What physical aspects can we address for this patient? You might want to individualize them. You want, might want to have a look at realistic goals. And when you're addressing physical aspects, you want to reduce limitations and then improve things. So you're going to want to reduce the deconditioning, work on the fear avoidance, um, desensitize the patient, and then gradually reactivate the patient, stretching, flexibility, range of movement. Um, moving on to core motor stability, you might use hydrotherapy, posture control, those kinds of things that a physiotherapist might do uh, within a pain program or individually. You're going to want to educate them on pacing and activity. You want to get your patient to resume those normal levels of activity and get them back working at home, get them back working in society and get them back to work as well. The functional things that you might want to address along with your allied health colleagues such as uh, occupational therapists would include, again, reducing functional impairment and then working on improving things, um, reducing the stressful things that hurt the patient. So stop twisting, stop bending, changing the way they need to do things. Your patient might love gardening, and that's one of the things that you need to address and improve. Your patient might want to get back to work, and you might need to address a number of vocational or work issues. You want to reduce the patient being off work. You want to get them back to work. You want to get them to be productive when they get back to work. And then, of course, the psychological, social issues that might be addressed uh, by a pain management program. Again, this might be individually or as a group. You're going to want to get them to participate firstly. You're going to want to reduce uh, stress, and this can be done uh, by whole body relaxation, using meditation, Tai Chi, or whatever it is that your local pain management program does. 
Or you might want to target the stress reduction elements, so, um, so biofeedback, so this targeted parts of the body that require stress reduction. Key factor of pain management program is going to be behavioral modification and, and co cognitive restructuring. Fancy terms for saying changing the way they think, changing the way they move and act. Um, you're going to want to deal with anxiety issues, mood issues, particularly depending on your patient. Uh, sleep may be a problem and that will need to be addressed. You're going to want to deal with relationship problems if there are any. You're going to want to improve the patient's self-confidence because most of these patients are going to be lacking self-confidence. You're going to want to improve their self-efficacy, so you're going to want to get them confident to enjoy life and enjoy the things that they need to do despite the pain. You're going to want to improve their locus of control, so let them take responsibility for the situation, understand that they can change the situation that they're in. Definitely going to want to reduce catastrophizing, which we'll come to another, at another point. And you want to get them to re uh, improve their gains and manage their pain flare-ups by themselves and not coming back to hospital or representing to the emergency department. An important factor of management is going to be education. Uh, you can't do any of this without educating the patient. Talk to them about acute pain, chronic pain. What are the differences? Talk to them about stress and pain and how stress can um, make pain worse. Explain to them what happens when they're deconditioned and why it's important that they keep their body moving. And the cycle of education that happens in pain management programs are going to go something like this. You're going to assess their level of um, knowledge. This is going to be done by your, your colleagues that run the pain program. You're going to give them new skills, give them new knowledge. You're going to let them go out and practice those skills. They're going to come back. They're going to rehearse them in front of you. You're going to reinforce those new skills that they developed. So that's the cycle of education that is so important for these cases. So for example, in your, in your case, you might be discussing your plan and goals, something like this. And from a medical point of view, I'm going to want to improve her analgesia because she's in moderate to severe pain. And you might talk about how you're going to go about this. I'm going to want to manage um, her antineuropathic agents, and you may choose to switch to gabapentin because it's cheaper. I might use this as a bridging medication, and you would talk about the doses. I would aim to opioid reduce her. She's on high levels of opioids, and you would talk about this per se. You may consider a serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor, something more to discuss. And I'm going to choose to do a diagnostic sacroiliac joint injection, and I might further want to investigate her with an MRI scan because she hasn't had one for 10 years. I just want to exclude any physical red flags. The functional and psychological approach to her management might go something like this. I'm going to want a full team assessment by occupational therapy, physiotherapy and psychology for a multidisciplinary management and admission into a pain management program. The physio and occupational therapist, I'd like to confer them to confirm my findings. I'd like them to add in new additional findings because they always will find things that you've missed. I'd like them to do baseline assessment and an assessment of the patient's goals. The psychology, um, I'd like a psychologist to explore the sleep quality, cognitive, um, and as well as cognition, and further reassess the low mood and suicidal intent and thoughts of self-harm. I might get the psychologist to, to do some um, psychometric assessments, such as the Beck Depression Inventory, the State Traced Anxiety Index. My aims would be as follows. Um, the activity aspects of the program, which would use individual uh, physio and occupational therapy sessions, might focus on showing the client that she should see the management team as helpers and not healers, so changing the way they're thinking. This would show the patient how to modify her behavior outlook from passive to active. They, would start the, they, would, they may start with some baseline measures for sitting, standing, walking, etc. Um, and they would get the patient to perform activity and pain diary for a couple of weeks, followed by an educational review, and then we would set up some realistic physical and functional goals. We would assess tolerance levels and we'd refocus on reactivation and increasing stretch flexibility. Um, they would gradually increase the levels of activity as well as educate. Um, I'll move on. Uh, this would all be done by small pain management uh, groups. And the aim of these sessions would be driving behavioral modifications and aiming for self-management. Because this patient that I've assessed was physically passive and displayed guarding, 
um, this will be part of the focus of the individual sessions. As part of the small pain management program, she would undertake a weekly educational session, and you might choose to elaborate on this and what you want her to learn. And you might talk about, again, cognitive restructuring being an important part of this patient's pain management program. You're going to do whole body relaxation by X, um, and you're going to do some gym sessions with individuals by, individualized by feedback. And ultimately engage her in home-based activities and get her back to her children, which is something she was uh, need, needing to do. And of course, you would also want to mention your follow-up of these patients. So when are you going to follow them up and how are you going to follow them up? Who's going to follow them up as well? So what I've given you is an overview of the history and examination, how to approach your patients in pain. Um, and I've given you quite a number of aspects of the history and examination. I hope that you will take away parts of this that you require for your practice.